the title of this um, recording might be a bit of a misnomer. I've recently attended a lecture from someone who also consider them, considers themselves to be an epistemic responsibilist, like Catherine Elgin's position. And the exposition was all about decolonizing knowledge and the problem of relativism. And she wasn't trying to positively define a structure of how you can decolonize knowledge, but she was just basically saying that there's a general argument that pertains to colonization, or at least how it's conceptualized, and how it sort of invariably leads you into a kind of relativistic conundrum. And so the, the issue would be is that you just, you know, go another way. You have to sort of do something else. She doesn't sort of define the answer. She just sort of says that this needs to be part of the major consideration in moving forward on this buzzword and moving forward on this whole array of, of this fad. Um, now, Catherine Elgin, I think, has similar leanings uh, you know, I, she doesn't directly bring this up too much. Sort of, it comes up slightly indirectly in her illustrations and things like that. I mean, so I'm perhaps projecting and conflating some level of, of let's say, ideological adherence to the sort of this cookie cutter, you know, sort of movement that's sort of this kind of this subtle intellectual sort of thing which can't really express itself robustly because it doesn't really have any solid groundwork. It doesn't have any sound, reasonable, positive constructions. It's just this kind of empirically sort of like sociological reduction that is just sort of taken as an empirical fact that we're still in the process of colonialization. And so it is obviously an epistemic necessity. I mean, I, I haven't heard of Catherine Elgin, I think, I, I mean, I, I'm not aware of all the academic things, but I mean, Catherine Elgin, I think, has said things that resonate with some of the, perhaps the work that I've seen uh, from the lecture that I attended of this other professor. But, you know, there, there's this other sort of buzzword, which are epistemic injustice. That's what I'm going to focus on, which is like, and I'm going to be talking about it. And I, I, I mean, suffice to say, I think that this is intellectually resonates with Catherine Elgin, and that is a bit of a conjecture. And you know, that's perhaps slightly unforgivable. And the title of this recording will be slightly um, awkward. Uh, but it seems to me that her intellectual position, I'm, I'm not, I am perhaps going to be putting essentially. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be. Yeah, so I mean, I guess I shouldn't address this to Catherine Elgin. Um, that's a bit awkward. But everything that I've heard tends to make me believe that there is... I mean, the reason why I care is because epistemological responsibilism I consider to be a very robust, in fact, the only valid sort of conceptual structure but then the idea that people who believe in that structure as being the superior kind of system then also adhere to this other sort of heuristic junk which is sort of which really gets away with the most egregious kind of intellectual dishonesty um, and and sort of relativism you know it's interesting because on some level in terms of epistemic responsib uh, responsibilism there is a kind of abject existential absurdism kind of relativism which you can't escape from and which that's what epistemic agency is there to fill the void of is that essentially because uh, because there's this there are conceptual uncertainties and things like that because we, we're not there, there are no sort of objective conceptual abstract boundaries which impose themselves on us we, we sort of um, we forthrightly forge forward um, with the only reservations that we have that we can say uh, are internal facilities. 
Um, and and we we take full uh, uh, responsibility for operating these internal facilities. And although perhaps we just innately have them, or you know whatever account we choose to give to those things, like uh, we make those accounts true by our continual assent uh, through some kind of process that you might call reflective endorsement, and so they're up for revision. But it is all the all that weight is carried by by the epistemic agency of of the individual. Now, if you have this kind of epistemic system, how you can sort of start start sort of spell binding yourself into a kind of in in so sort of how you can sort of incept yourself or or let yourself be abducted into a story that sort of. Where, where you appear in the middle of the story and the story is already in process and then you're, you're sort of you you, 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 you you allow yourself to be arrested by that process and then you're forced into reacting to it because of the supposed sort of swathe of epistemic injustice that that it portends you know and so you're forced to be a kind of reactive epistemic agent that's standing up against epistemic injustice this is fucking ludicrous where would you stand in order to observe these things you would have to stand outside of your epistemic agency you would have i mean like you know, there's so many problems with constructing epistemic injustice like this it it is preposterous this is absolutely puerile and abject Who does the epistemic injustice belong to? Does it belong to the system? Does it belong to the system of knowledge which is owned by an ethnocentric relativism, by some kind of sociological generalization, some kind of collective entity that is an amalgamate of individuals? And how does that amalgamate reflect or represent or relate to the individual and the individual's epistemic agency how are you not divesting epistemic agency but also moral consideration out of the individual away from the individual and associating it with this generalized construct now i i i don't know because because they haven't actually structured their system positively they've only structured it negatively in that oh well we're part of this system of oppression so we we just must resist and it doesn't matter what we do, we must just be disruptive. That's sort of the narrative, that's sort of in progress or whatever, that they sort of find themselves in and they just sort of empirically thumb suck that. And so they don't have to like ground that in any philosophical you know, sort of reason or sense or, or rationale. Um, so they don't have to do the work of setting up a framework for their rationale. But suffice to say, I can't be certain as to what they are vesting, that ep that epistemic injustice, or and moral consideration. I don't know what they're associating it with, but I know for damn sure it's not the individual. It's certainly not an individual that has any kind of um, uh, 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 it, it, in fact it, it invalidates. Uh, the concept of an individual being allowed to to view themselves in a non-racially self-identifying, you know, sort of uh, uh, um, you know, it, it it strips that right of the individual. It says no, no, no. There, 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 there's this objective structural that we import from some kind of sociological thing, and we're going to say no, no, no. Your your epistemic agency has been suspended by this new form of moral positivism that we're just going to sort of like, oh, this is the true substrate of the world. Didn't you know? Actually, there is this external objectivity. There, there is this absolutism. Um, and now we're going to prescribe how to, how to redress and balance this system. So, I mean, this whole sort of, I mean, just 
I mean, I, 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 I think I posed it correctly when I sort of asked the question right at the end of this question and answer session after, after this lecture took place and there was some discussion, is how do we know that there isn't implicit relativism within uh, concealed within some hidden premise of decolonization itself? How do we know that decolonization isn't innately dependent on some form of relativism? I mean, I, I don't believe, I mean, like, I, I agree that that's an open question. And I think the only way that they get away from, from not having to concede that is by never answering the question in any concrete way. They just sort of divert you away from asking that question. And then they will just sort of shame you for challenging their just process of trying to sort of manifest justice in the world and then they call themselves agents and they think of themselves as agents of epistemic redress of the epistemic injustice and also uh, in so doing they are the promoters of this ethnocentric relativism but you know they can sort of conceal that from themselves but also, I mean, this is the problem of sort of defining your whole project in the negative, in that they know what is evil. It's like they don't know what they're doing and that it's good. They just know that they're disrupting and resisting what they define as evil. But the damage that they're actually undoing, like, well, if it's epistemicide, as they call it, or, you know, if the, if the truth has been killed, if, if epistemic injustice, because you see, you're calling something epistemic injustice, that means that there has been an injustice done to the truth. If there's been epistemicide, that you've killed the truth, well, how is that amenable to redress? How can that ever be repaired? So, you know, in some sense, they have to actually import a different kind of analogy, but they can't really have it both ways, because the only way that they can get around with not grounding any of their stuff is by saying, well... We didn't set up the system, we are victims of it, and therefore it's not on us for adopting this paradigm. It's sort of the, the paradigm has been forced, thrust upon us, you know, it, it's just, and, and we just sort of have to deal with it responsibly by being 100% defensive and reactive to it in, 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 until it's dismantled. But then they also want to sort of make the case that actually, no, the epistemicide actually isn't complete it's about to be complete it's like a kind of you know it, it's like in terms of it, it's a form of, of kind of like slow genocide that hasn't been quite finished that the knowledge system is like is is virtually on the verge of of being killed but it's not actually dead yet and so we have to do everything necessary uh to reverse the process to bring it back and, and like, what does it mean to bring it back? What does it mean to sort of resuscitate it from its near death, you know, sort of thing? Or, or if, if you want to use the analogy that it is dead to resurrect it, because if it can't be resurrected, then what, what the hell is even being accomplished by this? You know, like, what is it for? So if, if you cannot provide redress, you know, and I would say that epistem epistemological injustice or epistemic injustice is fundamentally probably one of those things that cannot be reversed because if it is truly an injustice against the truth then it's like by definition it's like how do you repair the truth i mean surely that's that's a perennial question that's an independent question why does that need a special treatment of of a special ad hoc process that is viewing epistemic agency from the outside you know, as soon as you assault sort of the concept of the individual and you want to displace it with some kind of instrumentalizing analysis and social reductionism, like, I mean, again, it's so obtuse, but you, you've actually deprived your, your epistemic system of its grounding in terms of, at least in, in relative to epistemic responsibilism. So it seems that I think these people, they don't see the incommensurate, you know, sort of problem that they have. Um, and they can only do that essentially by...
disguising it and convoluting the issue by starting by starting up the engine in the middle of the story by by sort of commencing their 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 activity you know according to to sort of this um you know it it's really allergic to epistemic responsibilism uh, their their whole position it has this built in vulnerable narcissism self sympathizing intellectual sympathizing with this ethnocentric relativism which they don't want to quite admit is an ethnocentric uh, relativism just yet because they can just sort of scapegoat in order to to pass the buck and say no 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 we don't even want an ethnocentric worldview it's just that our worldview has been uh, demolished and degraded and debased you know so all the while you're projecting this tremendous form of bad faith which seems to me tremendously and egregiously hysterically untrue as if academia itself is not thirsty for being improved and and refined and developed and evolved as a knowledge system the idea that like you know you know and again also the idea that academia and knowledge itself and or fields specific fields don't themselves thrive on effectively committing epist epistemicide relative to their own internal knowledge community you have to define what is not relevant you have to define what falls out of your field in order to sort of get anywhere and i understand that there are lots of philosophical fundamental independent problems in that in the sciences and in philosophy that need to that need revision uh, that need to be looked at but the idea that decolonization is going to be the centralizing theme of how you can sort of address these things when it is uh, just the new colonialization it is neo-colonialization just with a with a new uh, uh, brittle and rigid uh, dogmatic uh, uh, sort of groupthink I mean you know it, it's uh, very anti-intellectual um, in how it depends on on sort of the currency of its orthodoxy it's quite disgusting in that way it's quite anti-intellectual um, and the kind of and the self-pitying intellectualization that it sort of adorns itself with um, in order to insulate it it's quite uh, uh, toxic premises um, and sort of outsource their accountability onto a kind of uh, egregiously uncharitable, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, I mean, if you just look at all the money that has gone to race and gender studies and, and, you know, to fund the complaining about how essentially the other parts of academia have not adopted and allowed this kind of vulnerable narcissism to to bully and and to redress people's ethnocentric egoisms you know that until we have a separate and equal set of racial egoisms and ethnocentric egoisms that you know things aren't in balance and, and what does that even mean you know like in terms of translating it into knowledge i mean sorry what i was going to say about how fields operate on epistemicide is that like for instance i'm sure that there were gaelic metaphysics i'm sure that there were many european uh, systems of of knowledge and things like that that were completely trammeled and discarded uh, by western modernity you know the the idea that um that there's some kind of monopoly on subversion and suppression and and you know systemic oppression or something like that well i mean to the extent to which the sciences are systemically oppressive is because they 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 have independent problems in their in their philosophical construction which is very poor um they don't you know they're not cogently and coherently um constructed it, it's like you know it's a mess it's a shambles um But, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, there are Gaelic metaphysics somewhere in academia, just as there are African studies before this fad, 
there were African religious studies that were in philosophy. There were, you know, many things um, in anthropology, you know, like the departments that are going out and looking for this stuff, you know, perhaps that's the point of conduct, uh, point of um, contact of how these things filter in. Or perhaps there needs to be a new department discovered or founded or, or uh, sort of invented as a sort of independent sort of thing. I mean, I guess that's almost what race and gender studies purports to be. But, you know, I mean, you would hope that it would be something that would be less fascistic and less, you know, uh, reductionist in its kind of sociological and, and moral outlook. Um, you know, tr trying to conceal its very... I hate describing how pernicious it is, but, I mean, you know, it, it's... Um, I mean, it's basically just kind of political propaganda, essentially, to try to subvert uh, the liberal moral paradigm um, of, of an individual. Having moral consideration and instead divesting that moral consideration from the individual into something that is more amenable to some kind of obtuse, top-down ad hocly administered, you know, sort of pliable moral landscape. Of vague moral prescriptions that you have to go and jump through the, the requisite hoops being described at you, because if you don't come out with the right outcome, then how do you even know that you followed the prescription that was given to you? So it's like it sort of it begs its own question. And if you don't sort of prove the ideology right, then it means that you actually weren't acting in good faith, you know. So it's, it's got this weird kind of internal expectation. Which means that it isn't premised in any kind of proper set of principles. It's not grounded in principle. It's merely grounded in this very sort of vague kind of conjecture that something to do with well, we know that epistemic injustice occurred. So therefore, we must have an outcome. I mean, I would concede that perhaps epistemic justice uh, was likely to occur and did occur. But to the extent to which epistemic injustice has been perpetrated, it, will, it won't leave a trace. Because if it can be remedied, then it's not a question of epistemic injustice. It's a question of process. And why are you trying to invent a special ad hoc process in doing this? If you know specifically what epistemic injustice potentially could pertain to, and it hasn't died yet, that knowledge system has not died yet, then you know exactly which item of information is there to be added. So there are too many convoluted um, technical problems essentially with this because essentially I, I do think that it is trying to adjudicate from nowhere um, but essentially how it gets away with this is it's sort of it's got this conceptual outline which is outlining what I can only technically describe as hypothetical damage because the only thing that you can do anything about is damage which is not irrec it, that is not irrevocable uh, but, you know, is not done, but it's not undone, but it must be considered as being sort of like partially done, and just partially done enough that you can assign a scapegoat to blame for the position that you're in, and then use that scapegoat as leverage and justification for why there needs to be a kind of parasitic extracted special treatment process, like some kind of two-stage thing to sort of rehabilitate the epistemic environmental integrity or something like that the shared system you know so you posit all these things which are just completely devoid of having epistemic agency vested in individuals but you have to have a caretaker a furor over the system that there is this some kind of furor principle that things need to be conserved for the ethnocentric relativism uh, involved that some someone needs to stand up for the ethnocentric relativism you know it really has this uh I mean, she wasn't intimating 
what the positive structure would look like, but I mean, this is actually the only actual solution to it. I mean, these kinds of positivistic moral thinkers, you know, they are just rehashing Nazi philosophy. Um, I mean, if, if we lived in Weimar, Germany, and Hitler had attended this lecture, he would have said, yes, this is a useful idiot. This is someone who is spreading the fascistic conception of society, spreading the sociological reduction of moral consideration in, into uh, uh, conspiracies of, of privilege. And, you know, I mean, like how it's, it's no different from the Jewish conspiracy. You know, the call to decolonize your mind is the call to to remove the, the Jewish conspiracy. You know, it, 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 there's so many parallels. It's like it's blinding. Um, but, you know, this is what perennially happens because you have people with these with these political temperaments, with these intellectual sort of tendencies. And unless they are actively suppressed, you get these fascistically minded people. They just they take over and they control the orthodoxy and they install themselves as a cultural hegemon. And then they just facilitate the corruption of all institutional values. Because they can just, they're happy to replace them with these ad hoc moral codes and, and they corrupt the legal system and they betray the constitutional values and it doesn't matter because they're do, th th what they're doing is empirically factually sound. You know, that, that's the sort of intellectual self-sympathizing that they offer as an excuse that, oh, well, obviously we need to go along with this new buzzword that happens to be in, in the current uh, political arena. You know, you know, it's, it's like whatever vernacular just happens to be around, you know, let's just ride this tide because what I'm doing should be just as exciting as what's in the, you know, at the sort of, at, at the zenith in the zeitgeist, you know. So it's just the sort of, this very opportunistic pseudo-intellectual cabal, which, I mean, they should, I mean, I can make analogies forever. You know, if you look at the KKK and, you know, and it's sort of, and, and where it made its home in the Democratic Party in America. And, and if you look at how it culturally operates with its weird kind of soft racism and, and things like that, I mean, you can see how it, how it exists in this, in this uh, political sort of temperament, but also how they organize themselves. You know, they know that what they're doing is complete abject conjecture. It's unsound, ungrounded, but it's just so uh, exciting for them. And, you know, and, and the only way that they can get away with it is essentially is that they make this echo chamber and they all believe in the same kind of uh, orthodox credential of authority. You know, that they, they have the, the they have the titles, they have the, the academic credentials, they have the position and then they use that position. And then and then, you know, it doesn't matter how unsound what they say is because they are called the Grand Dragon Wizard or, or whatever. They're called the, the Grand Vizier. And th those are the, the real titles that are used within the KKK. You know, at least they're transparent about their uh, mystifying cultural, you know, sort of, uh, you know, paternalism, you know, w w w which they're trying to sort of insulate and encapsulate within some kind of mystique and some kind of, you know... Um, you know, I mean, it's basically like neo-Druidism. You know, it's funny because, you know, all of this is called under the banner of decolonization, but nothing could be sort of more European in its origin than this kind of disgusting... I mean, okay, if you want to say that, like, the Nazis, I, th I think that the kind, of, the kind of control and propaganda that the Nazis have, the kind of cultural ethos that they have, I think... Well, okay, I don't want to talk about conspiracy theories, but, I mean, they... You know, there they have been links to how that is linked to sort of some aspects of Druidism and, and things like that, the sort of the control of the mind and such. But, um, I mean, to me, I think that this is a perennial issue because a quarter of the population just have a certain personality style. They just have a temperament which they like setting up in-groups and out-groups because that help, helps them to order their intellectual sort of valences, the, it, it helps to position themselves, um, you know, uh, 
they, they like to navigate this kind of social politics because then they can sort of be a gatekeeper and, and, and they can see themselves as offering up a kind of an intellectual justification for their sadistically edged vulnerable narcissism so that they, they, they can define all of their sadistic you know kind of disruption as having a kind of intellectual um, necessity in terms of that they're safeguarding the moral precepts you know they're, they're kind of like the moral enforcers um, you know and, and you can see how they would allow themselves to sort of develop you know into more and more you know Gestapo like interventions and such um, how they culturally will I mean okay you know these people are kind of on the verge probably of, of the Fuhrer principle uh, they still haven't quite sort of given birth to that yet but uh, you know you can see it's starting to coalesce and in fact culturally and let's say intuitively politicians already realize this they, they vie for I will be the protector of the ethnocentric relativism I will promote the interests of the ethnocentric relativism to choose me as your paternal guardian of the identity and, and let me be the representative of the guardian and the savior of the system to bring balance to the system let, let me be the uh the one ring to rule them all and to use the invisible force of being able to intervene in an ad hoc way give me the the superseding power um to to, to be given the right to to judge and adjudicate the system from outside the system you know and and that is the hypothetical power because when you're in that uh, it's it's very seductive and appealing because when when you give yourself the intellectual capacity to do that then you can sort of you can judge relativistically but you can think that you're doing so in in a way that that is is sort of it's paid for by the scapegoat it's paid for by the blame of of the ideological enemy or or the the people who have imposed the problem so you actually you get addicted to oppression sadly you actually you can't do this in imaginative exercise until you have a kind of uh, uh, the requisite sort of victimization which is why we have almost the commodification of victimization in our culture where it's like you have many elite people who are somehow still being oppressed because their identity has has a kind of has a has a narcissistic scar their identity is their narcissistic scar it is their free pass to have this imaginative you know being able to judge everything from outside of everything uh to judge everything from nowhere and the only way that you can do that is you can say they put me in nowhere so that now i can judge everything the oppression put me in nowhere that even though i have all these things i still feel oppressed because collectively my identity is oppressed because I can use that generalization and then I can sort of trick my own epistemic responsibilism and then I, I'm, I allow myself to be a just kind of an epistemic reactionary and, and this is what this kind of ideological and intellectual ilk are forwarding just more of the kind of inane fragments of groupthink that allow people to believe that, you know, oh yes, people are singing to this chorus. It, it seems to be passing all the kind of, all the rules because it's sort of, it, it has a kind of popularity and you don't hear people decrying how sort of ludicrous it is. And all the people that are calling it ludicrous are exactly the problem that is described. They're the, exactly the kind of oppressors which are maligned by this disgusting narrative, which is so intellectually embarrassing and vague and dishonest. But it can conceal all of that by just saying, oh, I thought you should have already been on the same page. I, why should I have to substantiate? Uh, you have to prove the negative. You know, it sort of shifts the onus and it just says, no, but this is just empirically true. So, like, if, if you want to make sense of, of my empirical claim about the truth, 
which then I'm relying on for some kind of semantic philosophical definition that I never actually do the work of, you know, like, you know, you just have to talk and then I'll just call you racist after, after you, 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 you try um, set straight all of the convoluted uh, conflations that I've been making in the generalization of, of then being able to rely on this identity politics bullshit. So I, uh, that was a whole illustration I was talking from the point of view of someone who defends this kind of vile intellectual virus. Anyway, okay, I think I've said enough. Um, so I, I started off this recording by just making, by trying to sort of capture, summarize sort of general philosophical take on this stuff, but um, I'll have to, do I even listen to my own work? I'll probably add another recording after this that will probably repeat a lot of this stuff. This is, I think, will be the, my last, hopefully, recording on this, my latest recording on this, so it might be more salient and cogent, but it just, um, I think I've outlined all the important sort of things, the features that I wish to be underlined because they are the most important, let's say, morally clarifying, centralizing themes um, as to sort of how to see, let's say, the what should be the normative approach that is the normative approach according to the constitution and then how essentially this intellectual virus has not it's weird as well because it's sort of it's done it subtextually it's 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 betrayed the constitution and it subverts it quite seriously i could have made also a lot more illustrations sort of explaining how this is a, a how how this ideology is rehashing Nazi philosophy and and there are other illustrations to be made around that and also the kind of the, the Napoleonic corruption of the law, which you know wouldn't I mean most legal systems have already been corrupted by the Napoleonic sort of you know sort of t uh, temperament, but you know South Africa is the only existing example of of a of a system of law that is based purely on principles. And so to see our legal system corrupted, uh, like all the other disgusting legal systems that exist in the world, is um, it is a bit worse. Uh, it will be very interesting if we ever sort of get a we sort of address the scale of the depravity and the decadence of this period of our history, if we can sort of perhaps have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and, and sort of get through these academics that were part of this cabal of, of and, 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 you know, um, we need something like a McCarthyist purge, I would say, to just to get, to stop this, to stem the damage that is being done to the Constitution. But, um, Oh, we, we need to remove the Chief Justice. I mean, he's one of these ideologues. You know, I mean, he, he, he constantly forwards this thesis of collective punishment. I mean, he's literally a war criminal in the waiting. He openly advocates for this ethnocentrically derived sense of yes the state is allowed to instrumentalize people it is allowed to instrumentalize its citizenry and dispense a collective punishment based on his interpretation of social justice which is a racialized version you know how can you interpret in a non-racialist document social justice to be a racialist premised notion you know it's it's just yeah, I mean, it's just, it's ludicrous, it's insane. Uh, the world is turned upside down. And it doesn't help that you have these mediocre pseudo-intellectuals covering the trails of this disgusting creed. Uh, 
of, of revamped, rehashed Nazi philosophy. Oh, I, I didn't elaborate how I wanted to, all, all the things about the state and legal positivism, but uh, I've done, that might be better expressed in the other recordings. Uh, I was trying to sort of condense um, the summary sort of headings and titles of, of the things that I was sort of um, complaining about or ideologically opposing. And I realized that, you know, I haven't provided all the sort of sequitur uh, points that need to be make, uh, made in order to establish a... Um, uh, you know, to, to reach all the conclusions uh, and claims uh, that I stated. So, um, and one of the things that I sort of vaguely remember as being, you know, not being fully fleshed out um, is, uh, I can't even name the theme, it's sort of, but it, it has to do with the kind of the toxicity of the kind of pseudo-intellectualism that proposes and, and that is the adherent to this kind of sort of moving you know, sort of, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like, okay, I would only come up with an embarrassing analogy, but, you know, it's sort of like commencing with this story that is already in progress, you know, as its kind of intellectual excuse for jumping onto a bandwagon. Um, but I wanted to, to explore the kind of the threads and, 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 and the things that make this up and how essentially the, the psychological analogies that I make with vulnerable narcissism um, are apt. So I, I'm going to sort of go into that. Um, so, I mean, I understand that on some technical level, I can't yet accuse proponents of this of like very clearly coming from a specific kind of relativism because I actually believe that they keep that question unstructured and vague and ungrounded so that they can essentially redirect that internal relativism as a kind of as an environmental complaint of epistemic injustice again it, it's slightly problematic because then they transport themselves into a nowhere place where they can adjudicate over this and then they can also excuse themselves for relegating their own epistemic agency and their own epistemic responsibilism gets replaced with a kind of epistemic reactionary reactionism or something like that which is functionally exactly how this ideology and, and these words and, and these buzzwords and, and that bandwagon, that's exactly how they function. Um, and then they can always just kind of, as long as they're in the valence of setting up uh, what can only be described as, you know, insinuating oppression, then they kind of, you know, as long as that's sort of one of the premises of their introductory, you know, sort of flow of argument, then they can get into all this like wild conjecture speculation as to the forms that have been lost that need to sort of regain their consideration and, and regain their kind of uh, an equal cultural space and that, you know, sort of imaginative hypothetical exercise of sort of quantifying what has been lost. Um, you know, which is how do you do that? If it is lost, how can you, how can it be quantified? You know, well, it can be quantified by um, indenturing the whole system into an ad hoc process that just the outcome will sort of vindicate uh, uh, the prescription uh, that everyone is sort of enforced to follow. And then, you know, the kind of the, the very strange kind of um, sort of you know, the process itself of, of engaging in this pseudo-intellectualism, it sort of, it begs its own question and it sort of gets away with it by just sort of compelling everyone to go along with the process that continues to beg its own question. Okay, but there's another way of formulating this, which is um, sort of, uh, it is easier to grapple with uh, because, I mean, that's almost on the technical sort of operative level and just looking at the dry aspects, it's sort of... Um, so almost abstractly, it is using hypothetical abstract claims and conceptual outlines, and it seems to use those things consistently, but because it never sort of grounds, you know, how these things are substantiated, it can sort of, it can sort of be involved in this meta dishonesty, which it disguises. Um, 
So, you know, it's much easier to track what's going on if you if you track it on the line of, of, of how the epistemic responsibilism has been displaced by this kind of systemic guilt and um, which has, you know, the, which is this paradigm from nowhere, which is this paradigm which judges the system beyond the system, beyond even the container of epistemic agency in order to say in in to hypothetically sort of try to redress the epistemic injustice that has been done to epistemic agents but by relocating let's say the address of that agency to some kind of conglomerated conceptual outline which i would say is an invalid kantian uh you know if in terms of kantian in terms of like um uh, treating an individual as an, as an ends in themselves and and other formulations of the categorical imperative but you know this is why I am sort of critical of Catherine Elgin and things like that, because I think that even though she rightly uses these sorts of Kantian formulations when she when she outlines um, epistemic responsibilism, um, Kantian, let's say, as soon as you try to institutionalize Kantian um, uh, uh, directives or, or, or principles into an institutional sort of operating function, I mean, the only institution that I think has done this successfully is something like the judiciary because it's, it's sort of it it has found out very quickly when you don't take a kind of practical and pragmatic you know you can call it compromise but you know at some level philosophy starts leading you down rabbit holes that don't that aren't fruitful that essentially just don't work essentially and so they have a kind of a much sort of more conservative threshold for toying with philosophical conceptual you know like structures and things like that uh, and that's sort of borne out in just the, the practice of law and so they they know they're more conservative about just following interesting self-consistent systems that seem to be self-consistent on an abstract level and you haven't sort of argued them from first principles you haven't grounded them properly <clears throat> um but okay anyway suffice to say i'm saying that you know kantian outlines because they outline uh, uh conceptually the most important vital things you know um uh, the kind of uh, not treating individuals as an uh, as a means to an end but in an, as an ends unto themselves and the other formulations of the categorical imperative if you try to institutionalize those principles um, and you haven't argued consistently from first principles uh, uh, with everything that, that they're sort of meant to purview, you know, that those institutions are given power over, you end up with a disgusting form of positivism. And I think Kant himself even envisaged these sorts of institutions, and he didn't have a good enough reading on his own philosophical um, machinery. Uh, I, 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 think, um, I think he was, he tended to almost uh, be part of this movement, uh, this, this sort of corrupt intellectual movement that, you know, you can create these institutions that there will be watch God, uh, watchdogs over, you know, these sorts of things. And I think that that whole intellectual line of, of um, sociolog uh, the sociological connection with philosophy, I think, is, is very dubious. And anyway, and this is yet more examples of it. And, and I think because it does lend itself towards what I can only call this this toxic, pernicious, self-fulfilling sort of thing. But anyway, if you can just say, like, okay, well, actually, what you have actually done is you've divested epistemic agency from the individual, and you've um, put it as somebody, as some institution's purview. You've put it as some mechanical sort of thing that's meant to be operative in the system, and then you just have to make sure that the conditions for that institution are like universal conditions are like perfectly self-consistent and things like that but i mean you know kant lived in an older time now we know that for instance even mathematics no matter how many axioms you might find to try to bolster it even mathematics cannot be self-consistent so we know that there are deep deep philosophical problems within a bounded conceptual frameworks um and that we can't uh, divorce ourselves from the need of constantly updating through reflective endorsement the kind of uh, a contextual that the, the epistemic agent is is underwriting contextual um uh uh sensitivity or uh, what's the word uh, the, the the impressions that the, the the epistemic agent is perceiving and or judging to perceive in terms of of um 
contextual uh, uh, rudiments and, and contextual environmental conditions or whatever, that uh, they are on the hook for that. They are accountable for that. They can't just sort of outsource that and say, no, 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 this is such a, an awful environmental, you know, sort of um, uh, sort of uh, train robbery that, that, that I was sort of born in the middle of the story of, and therefore, you know, I have to be defined and imprinted by it. Uh, not so. Um, especially if you look at, let's say, just how good things are, you know, it, you know, you, you really like to really have sympathy with the kind of argument that is divesting epistemic agency from these people and allowing them to engage in this epistemic reactionism is, um, I would just argue, is, 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 a, is a sort of, um, is a hyperbole exaggeration that is absolutely untenable, you know, but uh, and I, 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 I did, um, you know, you, you, you would think that slavery has continued, you know, and then they have to sort of analogize that, oh, no, the mind is, is enslaved by these social constructs. Well, then invent the subculture that doesn't do that, but they can't even do that. They can't even succeed in doing that. So they need help in succeeding in doing that to prove their argument. I mean, it, it's, it's preposterous. You know, it's like, help us prove you wrong and we can't even do it ourselves. You know, and, and, we, and the proof that we can't do it ourselves or the evidence that we can't do it ourselves is proof that, that we're right in this, in this model, in this narrative, which should be seen as this new orchestrate, uh, orchestrating um, central principle and ideological, you know, uh, so, sort of monomyth, you know, um, and it has that same relation to mythology as all fascist, you know, out, outgrowths of, of all fascistic ethoses, you know, um, operate. Um, okay, no, but, uh, let me just, okay, sorry, I, I was, that's, that's kind of digressing on the same topic, but let me just go back to, so, just to humanize this, and, and, to, and to see the kind of perniciousness, who wants to be affiliated, or be around anyone who has degraded their epistemic agency, and essentially, uh, by being swept up by a narrative that they claim to be in the midst of, you know, uh, you know, they make themselves a kind of hazardous, self-fulfilling prophecy of vulnerable narcissism. Willing to drag anything and everyone in its vortex of self-referential relativistic gainsaying. Uh, professing and excusing its own ad hoc process uh, uh, or, or prescriptive process um, because of merely anticipating the hypothetical outline derived by its relativistic conceptualization. You know, and, and then essentially they convolute and conceal that they are actually proposing a relativistic conceptualization. The truth is, is that that is, let's say, even from their perspective, up in the air. And many of, of the intellectuals of their ilk, they don't even care. They really don't even care. In fact, they would be happy to, to sort of surmise that actually we're not going to ever positively structure it. We're just going to sort of say that the answer lies between a combination of these like sort of categories and it's some combination within you know and and that's sort of good enough that we've sort of outlined that there, there would be something that could be complex enough from those different fields that are going to just sort of be mashed together in, a, in what only i could describe as a sociological reduction of philosophy of morality in order to get away with this so that you can sort of say that the sociological construct of, of a group entity of some generalization that can be sociologically factually epistemic uh, so, 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 that's that kind of their epistemological claim starts becoming a kind of an empirical orthodoxy and dogma which then sort of like has its the lever hand over the the philosophical positivistic machination you know and so you get this kind of sympathetic philosophy that's completely enslaved by this kind of this empirical narrative you know which they're, they're, I mean, conceptually, you know, no alarms are, are, no alarm bells are ringing, you know, as they do this, <laughs> you know, it's, it's sort of like, it's just, essentially, we, we're not even philosophers at this point, philosophy is just a means to a historical ends, you know, it's sort of, um, never mind how, you know, tunnel vision, rabbit hole, you know, diving, that kind of ethos is, um, this is the condition of their souls, they are fascists, uh, they, they are proponents of a fascist, um, 
sociological conception of society. Uh, they don't care about norms. Um, uh, their norms are, are fluid uh, to, to the needs and prescriptions uh, and, and, and the emotional needs of their bandwagon. Um, and they're happy to just adorn it with their kind of pseudo-intellectualism um, and their uncareful Because, I mean, they enjoy ju adjudicating it from nowhere. That, that's the truth. They, they have this abstract conceptual capacity and they want to access it in their mind. They don't want to order their imagination into an understanding. It's much better just to throw the understanding up into the air and what sticks sticks. And whoever isn't allowing them to do this, you know, this, this, you know, this kind of this, this vague framework for an almost, uh, Dionysian, you know, sort of um, revolutionary moment, who, who, whoever sort of is, is, is uh, uh, questioning and throwing shade on, on this, you know, um, advent of, of this fascistic epoch, um, uh, you'll, you'll just shame them. You, 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 you'll, 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 you'll just sort of like call them names and you'll just sort of like use this orthodoxy because i mean you can't you can't be this intellectually dishonest unless you have uh, a, a disgusting cultural hegemon uh, that that is capable of, of sort of um ad hocly apportioning dignity and, and integrity and instrumentalizing people for this for some greater collective buzzword of the bandwagon um and I mean, again, I think it is better to just understand this politically, that these are people that are very much interested in divesting epistemic agency and, and moral, con or approximately, they're interested in divesting moral consideration away from the individual and into something else which can be like more constructively wielded for some formulation of greater good, which its address is like, as a secondary, you know, sort of component is the individual, but but the the individual must subordinate itself to some greater absolute uh, uh, claim, and and because you can sort of imagine that everyone should be compelled to believe in this greater epistemic framework, then you can sort of you can do much better chess maneuvers. You can sort of order society in in such a way, and because this order is fundamentally, I think, d um, disingenuous and inauthentic and artificial. Uh, you know, we can already see the kinds of, of consequences that it brings, the kind of, uh, when you engage in this kind of policy, when you use uh, relativism as, as a kind of, as a policy um, criteria instead of non-racialist criteria, for instance, um, you know, you end up just creating more of this same ideology, more of the same consciousness. You, you, you grow identity consciousness, you don't grow the economy. You know, you don't grow jobs, but you sort of, you, you grow the retributivistic, you know, sort of cannibalism that, that, that is, is the kind of outcome, which is the only kind of outcome that can sate the prescription, or at least the, the, um, the, the hidden convoluted premises within the prescription that, you know, well, if it's not disruptive, then you're not undoing the epistemicide, you know, um, I mean, that's a problem is that it can never actually be satisfied. It doesn't have clear criteria to be satisfied it, because these conceptual outlines are like fundamentally impossible to ground. And in fact, they can't even be clearly delineated. Like, how would you tell a story in which at the end of the story, it actually works itself out? I mean, I, I actually dealt with all of these issues conceptually. I mean, it's taken a while for me to refine them in in dealing with identity politics, which is far more fascistic than um, than. Uh, well, I mean, it has the same themes as feminism, but I mean, um, I m many years ago I wrote an essay on essentially how children's cartoons and the princess movies um, were essentially the kind of demands that feminists have, it's impossible to deliver on them. It's impossible to make a movie that is actually worth watching, that actually meets all of the ideological criteria that they're demanding. And, and sort of in, in the essay in which I deal with that, it really shows the kind of the internal incoherence of their own outlook. Um, and the idea is, is that, you know, if you can't make their vague hand-waving uh, moral authoritarianism, you know, sort of, if you can't 
if you can't vindic- if you can't vindicate it for them, if you can't sort of maintain preserve their own integrity in their you know um, s- sort of uh, uh, what, what's the word that means you know like in their sort of uh, sloppy shooting from the hip or, or whatever you want to call it, um, th- then like. You're proving them right. You're vindicating their self righteousness even more because you're sort of because the, their whole narrative is is based on this, this sort of this passive aggressiveness that that they have just inherited this oppression and then they are forced to react to it. So I mean I, I think that you know if you just track what's actually going on, although you can't diagnose exactly what species of relativism they are um, depending on, you can say that they have definitely shirked and and. Um, their epistemic responsibilism um and i mean perhaps then the proponents of epistemic uh, responsibilism are interested in this issue because it's sort of like it's one step above the thing that they say that they're interested in and so you know they, they want to see if there's another layer above what it is that they're interested in but um in so doing you're no longer treating individuals um as an ends in themselves you're you're con- cons- uh constricting them and constructing them into a kind of um, environmental condition or narrative you know and again you know there are some things there are some situations in reality in which if you take them to their extreme it will seem to almost inductively justify the kind of the intellectual sympathy that you can kind of uh demand from from this contemplative model which i i still think technically can never work but let's just say like almost as an reductio ad, ad absurdum there can be situations which are just so stark a, a movie that that exemplifies this um is what i would uh snowpiercer sort of is 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 i think one of the things that are trying to depict this also in time uh which is a kind of a movie that sort of um is 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 a very stark kind of um, metaphor of capitalism, um, in some sort of nth moral, you know, like exaggerated degree. Um, but anyway, um, in which sort of in those circumstances, in those extreme circumstances. You can sort of, you might be able to actually, within the realm of moral responsibilism, take it upon yourself to do extreme measures that would seem to almost, uh, you would seem to follow plans and strategies that would sort of somewhat simulate or might sort of um, dovetail with the um, the kinds of prescriptions that you would extract from this hideous fascistic, um, you know, sort of reduction of things. But How far are we from actually um, those sorts of extremes? You know, you really have to uh, have this assumption of bad faith, this assumption that there is no one willing to work with anyone else based on these historical trends, that these historical trends have continued unabated, you know, uh, that these historical tragedies are like continually playing. You know, it's like there's a lot of fucking projection going on there it's completely unwarranted and in fact it's a complete diversion from actually if you were actually interested in solving the problems that are being outlined conceptually supposedly are being outlined conceptually if you look at just the money that that the out that the conceptual outline has absorbed the resources that the conceptual outline has has you know which are always just generating prescriptions telling other people how to solve the the inherent problem supposedly i mean it is you know the dog what is it the tail wagging the dog you know it's 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 so childish and futile and you know they call these people robust philosophers because they're dealing with very hard issues no they're not you've had the same kind of philosophy in 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 germany you know this is the same kind of you know the all those little hidinger ilk people you know like Oh, you can philosophize about sociological constructs. Well, fucking done, you know, uh, and and then you can say all these stark things, and 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 you can pretend to be a revolutionary, and you can be in sympathy essentially with the kind of ideology which enables a plutocracy to do whatever corruption that they want and conceal it because your philosophy is so piss poor. 
you know this these are the ilk of the useful idiots you know the, these are are the the handmaidens of the Führer and and they are hard at work trying to coalesce some kind of Führer principle that that is what they are trying to to condense and and refine and that is what they are slowly working towards but uh, you know it, because it's such a uh, a philosophical um, jumble that's fundamentally convoluted. They will end up fudging it, um, as 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 their current machinations and prescriptions are similarly fudged. It just becomes well. How do you fudge it to such a degree that no one can can sort of uh, th that you end up creating this moral imperative that no, just don't think about it. That that becomes how how you get away with it is you just say no, just don't think about it. These are the things that you're not allowed to think about because we can only think about it after we've reached this proximate sort of tipping point. So we have to reach this, you know, they just make a two stage uh, sort of um, process, essentially. And then because of the balance, the conceptual weighting between those two stages, that's their justification. And that's effectively what the Fuhrer principle is. And then, and then you sort of you try to also balance it between those two stages, because you say essentially, there's no, no, actually, humanity is a perpetual revolution. And we always need to allow someone to judge everything from nowhere. And so we actually have to, it's actually good to have a Fuhrer principle because it's our creation. This is the mark of our creation and our contribution to intellectualism. You know, they have, they sort of invent their own exceptionalism uh, as, as the kind of the capstone that sort of seals the deal of their self-fulfilling, self-agonizing, um, you know, perpetual intellectual sympathy extraction from the system. And it's like, no, we're allowed to do this because... And essentially, they always have to explain it as, well, uh, eventually it has to become a positive act that they have done, not just a negative reaction. They have to say, no, 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 uh, it, this was our, our birthright, but isn't it good that we had this kind of opposition that sort of ignited it within ourselves? And then you just have the internal dishonesty, essentially, between the Fuhrer and and the society. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think... I roughly think we're probably five years away from actually having a philosoph. I mean, it's not as if they need the Führer principle because culturally the Führer principle has already really functions. Like the in subtextually and intuitively, um, this is really how politics is run, and these are just the the philosophical handmaidens trying to sort of keep up keep pace, because if they don't keep pace, they won't sort of stay relevant and pertinent, and they want to be part of this exciting bandwagon. Uh, I guess that is the role. Of philosophical department heads now in this new society in this brave new world and order where well, I guess they can police their orthodoxies and, and they can enforce this loose moral conjecture and preserve the the seedlings of this uh, uh, hideous um, betrayal of the constitution as as the weeds have have clogged up and dismantled uh, uh, non-racial values and and the liberal society that is premised on moral consideration vesting in the individual that is the definition of social justice which they have reinterpreted with their vile and pernicious fascistic rehashing of nazi philosophy and then they call this, you know, African philosophy. I mean, it's, it's not as if it wasn't also an African ideological trend. I mean, like tribalism uh, is based on, as everything in humanity is based on personality, style, psychological temperaments. And all politics and philosophy are elements at some point of some kind of psychological um angle let's just say or some kind of you know and and so you know essentially we are living now under the cult of um and the cultural hegemon of what the west has been so good at suppressing at, at, at suppressing i mean it's not as if it's been 100 percent able to suppress this but the west has by far the most because of or only because i would say of the british uh, liberal outlook a uh, political outlook um, French liberalism I think is too much entrenched in Napoleonic um, premises it doesn't actually conserve 
uh, moral consideration in the individual. They are too obsessed with their culture, as it were. Um, British uh, political liberalism has this idea uh, of, of, of actually keeping a kind of a pristine um, intellectual facility that belongs to the individual foremost as and, and and that is the kind of let's say the the cornerstone of i, I know in the british system they don't have human rights te technically i mean uh, by treaty they have human rights but in the just in just in reference to the the british political liberal outlook um they they have a kind of um I mean, I do think it's it's even deeper than just calling something human rights or not human rights. It it it's it's more fundamental almost. Um, it, it's just this: this is what men are, and men in the generic sense of mankind, of humans. This is what humans are. Uh, this is what they possess. Uh, possess, and it, it and it is a, a spiritual facility almost. It's a, it's a, um, and if you sort of if you legislate against this although they they don't in the in at least in the british system there's nothing stopping you from legislating against this but um it's in their political culture as it were but uh, you know that if you don't have freedom of speech if you don't have certain things that you um you're legislating against uh the spiritual facility and um okay i know this is getting going to get too complicated if i talk about um the political realism which is baked into um, the British system um, because it's because in some sense the only thing that guards against legislating against this is the people themselves and the people know that they are voting in representatives into a, a body which is sovereign over them and which can essentially kill them in a technical sense it, it they can uh, impose laws against their own population because their parliament is sovereign so they can sort of do any heinous out egregious thing parliament is sovereign and uh, although that they wouldn't what stops them is essentially keeping the th kinds of high flutin things that i was saying it keeps them part of let's say the intellectual culture of the political ethos um which is a politically real way of like keeping it alive Whereas when you try to sort of put it into words and paper, then it can always be subverted if you don't also have the intellectual life preserving it and maintaining it and guarding it. And so I would say South Africa actually is way better in terms of what we have on the books, in terms of the legal structure that we have. It is the most advanced in the world. But, uh, you know, it only requires having um, this kind of pernicious ideology and then you can betray it very quickly by just misinterpreting things like misinterpreting social justice to mean essentially rehash Nazi philosophy, which is what we have and why we have a growing proponent of black fascism um, in, in the political uh, sort of arena. Um, and, and it's even spewed by the chief justice himself, who is effectively a war criminal in the waiting, because he just loves to tell you about how we need to engage in collective punishment in order to advance his interpretation of social justice, as he trammels the individual's rights, as he instrumentalizes the citizenry in favor of this higher goal of identitarian racial egoism. Um, and 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 to undo the epistemicide or whatever you know you, whatever adornment you, you you want to give whatever window dressing you want to put on it um okay well anyway i i think although still i i don't sort of completely round off my of of everything i have to say oh, there was a little bit of a recording malfunction right at the very end no no substance was lost but i just want to so i said although i don't completely round off all of the um arguments that i make i think I, uh, what i've just gone through is at least representative of, of sort of my intellectual um uh take on on all of these matters um and, and i do think that sort of if you um you know although it's not presented beautifully uh it does have i think all 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 the core of the of the of the arguments and 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 the sort of and and how i mean it could probably be neatened up to a large extent but anyway um